what's so special about special relativity? I'm not exactly sure. But I think, in my, in my opinion, special relativity is where physics gets really, really interesting. Oh. Oh, yeah. The appendix form is yellkey.com slash Can you close the door? Also, if you haven't turned in your homework, uh, you can put it on the like the front table on the left. Okay. So yeah, in my opinion, special relativity is where physics um, gets very, very interesting. I hope you'll see why. Um, but for now, let's start off with with Maxwell's equations. So if you were in lecture last Monday. Um, we went over these equations. If you weren't in lecture last Monday or you spaced out, then you, you still do not have to know any of the things in this equation. Um, but I will, I will try to make you see patterns in this equation, even if you don't understand everything about it. Um, so so in, on last Monday, we described that Maxwell's equations describe the behavior of the fields of electricity and magnetism. Um, and you have a certain charge, and you have a certain like magnetic or magnet or something. Um, and it describes how the fields will look. Now, we also we also went over in lecture how basically like physicists like to take things like equations, like Maxwell's equations, which represent something physical, something concrete, like charges and magnets. And physicists like to try to abstract that to something completely irrelevant. And in this case, what we found is that if even in an empty room, Maxwell's equations technically are only supposed to describe things involving charges and magnets. But even in an empty room with no charge and no magnet, um, if you wiggle the electric field, it results in a wiggle in the magnetic field. And so I can I can draw this out. I can draw this out. I need to use the equations. Like so, this is your wiggle in the electric field. This is your wiggle in the magnetic field. And this, if, and this satisfies all of Maxwell's equations if and only if this wave is traveling forwards at a speed equal to 1 over the square root of this constant times this constant. Um, and these two constants are, vacuum, are called vacuum permeability and vacuum permittivity. And you don't need to know what that means, but basically they're, they're properties of the vacuum. And you can measure these properties. Um, and so this is, this, is really, this is really interesting. So this, this phenomenon, this wave of electric and magnetic fields, we call light. And so this, this speed is called the speed of light. Um, and it's also just called C. Uh, so if you see C in, in this lecture today, it means the speed of light. Um, but this is really interesting. Like we've taken an, an equation that's supposed to talk about charges and magnets, and we've now suddenly applied this, and we can now describe light. Now, I'm going to ask you to talk amongst yourselves. Um, if you if you see any problem with this and something else we've learned in the class previously. So just like talk amongst yourselves. And, and, and if you know the answer, like don't spoil it. But like, um, but yeah, just talk amongst yourselves for like a minute or so. What's the question? The, qu the question is if you see a, if you see a conflict with, between this that you're learning now, like that C is, a, is here, is the speed of the wave of electricity and magnetism and something else we've learned in physics previously, um, namely in classical mechanics. Um, is there a problem with this speed? Yeah. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. Did, did you guys come up with any po possible ideas? Possible. If not, that's that's okay. Because uh, uh, I'll guide your, I'll try to guide your intuition a little more. But any potential intuitive conflicts in here? Yeah, it's a bad view or That's that's a good question. Yeah. Um, as it turns out. It's not vacuum. Like the light itself is not a, is not a vacuum. It's, it, it can have energy, just like anything else. Um, and it takes energy to create a light with it as well. Um, but okay, that's that's a reasonable that's a reasonable. I'll, I'll try to guide the intuition a little bit more. Um, so so let's say, and this is why it's going to be crucial for you to know who is who in this lecture. Again, I'm Shashank. Um, perhaps you know that in classical mechanics, like we learned, speeds can add together. So let's say I'm on a spacecraft. This looks kind of like a fish. <laughs> So I'm sitting on the spacecraft. And Shashir is sitting on the Earth. And Shashir is watching me. Okay. And this spacecraft is going at 100 meters per second. And I have a ball. And I throw the ball at meters per second, right? So I think from my perch on this rocket that I've just thrown the ball at 10 meters per second, so it's going at 10 meters per second. As far as I'm concerned, that's the speed of the ball. What do you think Shashir sees the speed of the ball? Huh? Yeah. So Shashir will see the speed of the ball as the speed of the rocket plus the speed of the ball, which is 110 meters per second. Who's right? Yeah. They're, so they're both right. In, in every sense of the term, there's no right answer to this. And that's, that's the point of what is called Galilean relativity. Um, um, there's no like one frame in which I am right or Shashir is right. If we're both moving at constant velocities, we can both describe all of the laws of physics as being the same in our in our in our respective reference frames. And this is a nice concept. It's, it's, it's a nice it's a nice property to have. But does anybody see why this might be a problem with Maxwell's equations and the speed we just saw? Yeah, that, that has something to do with it. Maybe talk amongst yourselves a little more and see if you can figure it out.
Any ideas? No ideas? Yeah? So the, isn't the speed of light the speed of the universe? So if you're going to the speed of light and you do something ahead, wouldn't it be going faster than the speed of light? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, the way that I, I like to think of it is, like, let's say, instead of throwing a ball, I throw light. Well, how do you throw light? Oh, you just bring a flashlight, I guess. So, I have this flashlight, and now I am... throwing light with, on the spaceship. According to me, the light is traveling forwards at the speed of light. Everything is fine for me. I'm sitting on the spacecraft. As far as I'm concerned, I'm stationary. And I'm shining a flashlight, and the light is traveling forward at the speed of light. But Shashir, on the Earth, sees the spacecraft. And he sees me shining the flashlight at C plus 100 meters per second. So, and, and we've just shown through Maxwell's equations that if light is traveling, propagating forward at anything except C, then physics breaks. Like, that means there, there has to be a charge somewhere. This, this doesn't work with, with Maxwell's equations. So clearly something is, something is wrong here. Um, well, now, now which one is right? Is it Maxwell's equations that are right, or is, is, it, um, is it Galilean relativity? Uh, th this, is, this, is, this is why, like, so, so one of them is clearly wrong. And basically, at, at this time in history, I think like the early 1900s, people did not know the answer to this question. And so one of the, one of the like, ideas they came up with is, Maybe there is something called an ether, which is like air. It's everywhere. Um, you can't see it. You can't touch it. Um, I'm not describing the force. I'm describing the ether. Um, and, and light has to travel at, the, at C relative to this ether. So this ether is everywhere, and, and light has to travel at C relative to this ether. What's the problem with, with this? idea um, of there being an ether. It might, it might not be very obvious. Like, we have our sun, we have the Earth. The Earth is orbiting around the sun at a velocity of 30 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast. And let's say this ether is just everywhere. The ether is not moving relative to everything else. The Earth is moving at 30 kilometers per second relative to this ether, at least. You also have the sun moving around the Milky Way and all of this other stuff. Does that mean if you shine a flashlight in this direction, it has a different speed than if you shine a flashlight in this direction? And, and if, if, there was, if there was an ether, this is what you would see. And uh, these, these, these two scientists named Michelson and Morley did a very simple experiment to figure this out, figure out the speed of light in different directions. And they basically figured out that this was not the case. Light does not have a different speed in any one direction on the Earth. So this idea of an ether is, is not correct. Something, something else is wrong here. And this is when, when Einstein comes up and, and solves everything like, like we've heard plenty of times. Um, so Einstein obviously came up with a resolution to this called special relativity. In my opinion, Einstein was not, did not, like, at least in coming up with special relativity, there was no a special amount of genius involved. Um, the math required for special relativity is essentially that you would probably learn in high school or in, in, in college, in early college. Um, but there was 
some level of like gut involved in this. Like he was, he was, he made a gutsy prediction, um, which seemed like it was obviously wrong and could have easily been proven wrong, but it, it just happened to not be proven wrong, and this was a pretty big deal. So this is special uh, relativity. And there are two basic assumptions to special relativity. One is that as long as you are in an inertial reference frame, the laws of physics are the same. basically just any situation in which velocities are constant, where I can't tell that I'm moving. If I'm on a rocket and it's traveling at a constant speed, then I can't really tell that I'm moving. If I'm accelerating, though, I can tell I'm moving. So it's not an inertial reference frame. Um, so that's the first assumption, that in, in, an inertial, in any inertial frame, the laws of physics are the same. The second basic assumption is that the speed of light is constant. no matter what. And that's basically a statement that Maxwell's equations are the correct one. So he, Einstein was saying Maxwell's equations are correct, Galileo was wrong, and Galilean relativity was wrong. Um, but another way to look at it is the speed of light is just fixed. It's constant. It doesn't change. This is this is both. So now, now let's take. Can I pull this up? No. Straight up, 
straight down, and that takes a certain amount of time. But according to Shashir, what would he see my clock doing? He would see my clock start off here, the light is emitted, but again, I'm moving forwards. So instead of going straight up like this, that's not right. Instead of going straight up, the light would actually go like this, because I'm moving forwards. And it would bounce off this mirror, and it would again move forwards. Now, my light clock, my, the light in my light clock, has traveled a longer distance. Yeah? Why would it be moving forward that way? Because once it leaves your emitter, mm -hmm. it's not being pushed forward anymore. So the new light is becoming later. So it's going to be the opposite way. No, according to Shashir. So we're talking about Shashir's reference frame here, right? So, so what he sees is that when the light is emitted, it's emitted not like straight vertically, but vertically and with a horizontal velocity. Um, and so his 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 light clock would go. I think I think it would help also to note that um, it's not like Shashank isn't drawing it to scale. In reality, it would be like a very very slight horizontal component. It would be yeah. mostly vertical, yeah. but like very, yeah. very. What it, what it would really look like is like, yeah, I'm not going to draw that, but like it would look like this. This is greatly exaggerated, but there is a problem here, and I'm I'm going to again like ask you to talk amongst yourselves. Remember, both of these light clocks, the light in the clocks are moving at the speed of light. We agree on that, according to special relativity. So what's the problem? So if you remember what that is, they're non-accelerating non um, uh, frames of reference. Yeah, so this, this, this light clock idea, it might be a little bit difficult to wrap your minds around, but if you have more questions, like feel free to ask, ask me in office hours or, like, or, or uh, on discussion on Wednesday. But the, the, what's wrong with this? Well, this particular, if, you, if you add these distances, the total distance this light travels is this much which is just this plus this. And the total distance this light travels is like this much. This is clearly traveling a shorter distance than this. Yeah, this, this light 
is clearly traveling a shorter distance than this. Yeah, but isn't also point with a slower time too? It takes longer to reach that point, therefore it bounces off. Why does it take a longer time to reach that point? Because that's going to be Yeah, but it's, it's traveling at C. So that's the thing. These both lights are traveling at the same speed, right? But, like, does it take a longer time for my clock to run than Shashir's? We should be measuring the same time, right? Like, this light clock, let's say this light clock is calibrated to, to take one second. One second on Earth should be the same as one second on my rocket. But it's going a longer distance. So what, what, what gives? Basically, what gives, Einstein said, is that time runs slower on my rocket ship, according to Shashir, than time runs for Shashir. So Shashir is looking up at my rocket, and he's seeing my time running differently. <laughs> um, so th this is like, this is mind blowing. This is huge, right? Time is, is different. This is like, yeah, this is, this is the big idea of special relativity, that time depends on, on who you're looking at and in what reference frame you're in. So I'll let, I'll let that sink in for a moment. But in the meantime, here's a curve. If any of you have watched the movie Interstellar, um, like this is a key premise of that movie and other and some other space movies as well. Like um, this is like this is and it should excite you. Like I think this is extremely exciting that your your wristwatch depends on how fast you're going. Yeah. Wasn't Interstellar the time thing? Wasn't that due to gravity? There's they have both in Interstellar, if I recall correctly. They also they have, have like component? what? They have they had a speed. They had a speed component on the way to like Saturn. Yeah, yeah. But we're, we'll get to the other part of that in oh, the that next was lecture. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it yeah. So what if the rocket was ex accelerating? Was that? I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that in a second, but, but, uh, but no spoilers yet. Now, but let me actually put a scenario, like a realistic scenario. I'm sitting on this rocket, and I'm going to the nearest star to visit my family on Alpha Centauri. Um, and Shashir's sitting on Earth and, and watching me go. Okay? And we both have these light clocks. And I go to Alpha Centauri and back. And Shishir's just here sitting on the Earth. This, 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 is a, this, is, this is a paradox. It's called the twin paradox. And it's slightly convenient that we actually have, um, we are actually twins. And we're, we're, we're explaining this. But let me draw out now what things look like for let me draw out what things look like on the other half of this. Okay, so Shashir is looking up at me and he sees my light clock going like this. And back down. Right? That's what he sees. But what, how do I, I, I'm getting lazy now. <laughs> now I have my light clock, and it looks to me like it's, to me like Shashir's moving backwards at 100 meters per second. Right? Do we get that part? So, it looks to me, like, Shashir's light clock is moving like that. Which means, I think Shashir's time is moving slower. So I go to Alpha Centauri and I go all the way back. And, in theory, we should both disagree on who's getting older and who's getting younger. Why, why isn't this the case? Do you guys have any ideas? Why don't we dis I mean, we obviously, obviously when I get back, one of us is younger and one of us is older. That seems like an incontrovertible fact. 
why is why is that unambiguous? Confused about why why one point should be younger and why one yeah. Is this a similar problem from the movie where she came back and his daughter was like about two years old? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the same. It's the same thing. But is anyone confused about why this is like physics wise? Except this this is distinct from the movie. Um, this is like a paradox in theory because like again like I'm looking at Sh or, or Shashir is looking at my clock and seeing that my clock is traveling a longer distance. Which means Shashir is seeing me and saying, my time is moving slowly. I am looking down at Shashir and I'm seeing the same thing. So I'm saying that Shashir's clock is moving slowly. Yeah? Uh, could it be the fact that like the two initial reference frames that are different from each other are counteracting each other in such a way that maybe they cancel out? That's 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 very close, yes. You're big. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I think you might be on the right track. Yeah. If so, so if I'm going to Alpha Centauri and back, and we're meeting on the Earth, what does that involve? Well, yeah, eventually we get back to the same reference frame, but in addition to that, that means when I go to Alpha Centauri, I'm moving. I can say I'm moving at a constant velocity, but then when I come back, that involves some acceleration, right? I have to. Decelerate, stop at Alpha Centauri, see my family, and then like, like accelerate and come back. Right? But then you see the same thing for the other guy from the Earth, right? You see him like decelerating. But this is a good question. This, this is a good question. Yeah. So, but the thing is, in an inertial reference frame, the laws of physics are the same. But I, when I decelerate, I can feel myself decelerate. Even I have to agree that it is I that I'm moving. Shashir is not moving. I'm moving. Right? And the, that happens when the deceleration happens. Yeah, if you ever felt yourself break in a car, you can very clearly tell that you are the one decelerating. Yeah. Right? So, like, the difference is that one person actually feels that deceleration, and the people on Earth don't feel that, so they know they're not. So, yeah. how, how do you quantify that feeling in physics? I mean, isn't it just like the force? Like, yeah, yeah. The force that actually you not Yeah. You, you, you have to exert a force, you have to put energy into decelerating. Um, and when you decelerate, you will feel a force in your reference frame due to your deceleration. So, so again, the two assumptions of special relativity were that inertial reference frames, the laws of physics are the same, and the, the speed of light is constant. But my, iner my reference frame is not inertial. So the moment I, s as long as I'm going at a constant velocity, there is inherent ambiguity in who's getting older and who's getting younger. The moment we decelerate, or accelerate, that's when it becomes unambiguous. And, and the moment I come back to meet him, um, now we're in the same reference frame, and now we can agree that I'm the one that's getting, uh, that's staying younger, and Shishir's the one that's gotten older. Yeah. So, and is this only linear acceleration? As opposed to? Well, like, for example, something's orbiting, mm -hmm. like the Earth is orbiting the sun, technically the Earth is accelerating that linear yeah. velocity yeah. changes. So. Um, that's, that's something I have to work out, work out in my brain. Like it, it, it is any form of acceleration um, um, because you're not, as long as you're not in an inertial reference frame or cannot approximate that you're in an inertial reference frame, these laws do not, um, uh, do not apply equally to all situations. Um, but I'll think about that more. Um, okay, so, so this is the twin paradox. It's not really a paradox. It's, uh, it's, but, but it's, an, it's interesting to think about. Yeah. So next, this is, this is time dilation. So I've just explained to you time dilation. So next I'm going to explain 
subsequent contraction. So, length contraction. Centauri, there's a certain distance between the Earth and Alpha Centauri. By the way, for context, Alpha Centauri is the closest star to the Sun. Yeah. It's a closest star system. Yeah, star system. But it's just a place I'm going. So, I'm going at, I'm going there. So both, both of us agree that the spacecraft is traveling at, whatever, 100 meters per second, let's say. Um, so, velocity is equal to distance by time, right? But I'm going to split this up. I'm going to split this up into my reference frame. And Shashir's reference frame. And in Shashir's reference frame, the velocity of the spacecraft is the same, 100 meters per second. Um, the length, we'll see. And the time, well, the time is different, right? Shashir is experiencing a different time from, from me. So if the velocity is 100 meters per second and the same, regardless, and the times are different, that means in order for this equation to work out, the length must also be different. So what this means is, when I'm traveling fast, I see things that are parallel to my direction of motion shrink. And that's called length contraction. When I'm traveling fast, I see things shrink. Um, and again, this, as in, as in everything with special relativity, this has to agree with, with, like, what Shashir sees. Everything has to agree. So in order to explain this, I'll, 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 I'll uh, try to give you, uh, maybe I should use the other whiteboard at once. Um, this is something called the pole barn paradox. Um, so I have, like, a barn with an open door, and, like, for some reason, I'm carrying a giant pole and I'm running really fast, like close to the speed of light fast. And Shashir is here, and I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing this, okay? Now, according to my, my point of view, I am running towards this barn, and because of length contraction, I think the barn is really, really short. And according to me, my pole is never going to fit through the barn. It's going to, it's going to stick out. There's never going to be a time at which, for me, the entire pole is in the barn. But according to Shashir, he doesn't see length contraction like I'm seeing. So according to him, I can fit the entire pole in this barn at the same time. So who's right? Again, okay. you can talk amongst yourself.
You can also like find a way to like I don't know like there are, you can like bounce the laser off of it or something and like measure the distance of the front of the barn and the back of the barn. Like there are ways to basically measure lengths, um, like even sounds, when you're not it at like something. It would be very hard, but uh, it's, it's very good. Let's say my my pole is ten meters. Whether I'm moving or not, again, the laws of physics are same in every reference frame. Whether I'm moving or not, I should agree that my pole is ten meters, right? That should not change. Um, but there is a very real discrepancy in whether I think the pole will fit through the barn or, and whether Shashir will think the same. So did you guys come up with any ideas on that? So is it the same as before why there's no actual ambiguity about who's older and who's younger? Because once you like, crash into the barn, you are... So, we're, oh, so, so the other thing is the barn's doors are open on both sides. Oh, so, okay. So there's no acceleration or deceleration. <laughs> I don't crash, fortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm intact. It's just a, it's just an argument over whether this will fit fully in the barn or part of it will be sticking out of the barn. That has something to do with it. Yes. Technically, he should be right. No, again, both of us are right. Um, both. So this is this is the other sort of mind blowing thing about special relativity. Again, both of us are right. So when we when we go through the, the when I go through the barn, what I see is I first see this part entering the barn, and then I see this part exiting the barn. At no point do I ever see both of these in the barn at the same time. So I'm using this term at the same time very carefully. Shashir will see both of these ends of the pole in the barn at the same time. What does this mean? This means that there is no one concept of simultaneity in special rel relativity. Meaning Shashir and I don't agree on what at the same time means. Um, so, what Shashir sees as both these ends of the pole are in the barn at the same time, I don't agree with that because I first see one event and then I see the other event, but because my perception of time is different, I don't agree with the, the instant that Shashir sees the, the two ends of the pole in the barn, I don't agree that those two times were at, were, this, were simultaneous. I think they were separated apart in time. And that's, that's the other big thing about special relativity. Simultaneity is not the same for different observers, for different reference frames. So, okay, that was a lot. But that's, so, so I think, I don't know if Nicholas agrees with me on this one, but I, I think most of the paradoxes, like the twin paradox or the pole barn paradox in special relativity, they're not real paradoxes if you think very carefully about the two basic assumptions of special relativity. Um, um, 
Yeah. Now, are there any questions about that? Probably a lot. We ex uh, if you if you like marinate over this and like come up come up with questions, special relativity is extremely extremely like counterintuitive, or it, ex it expands people's intuitions a lot. So we expect a lot of questions. So if you come up with any questions, we'll be answering them during discussions as well. So. But also, I, I still have a, like some things some some interesting things to get through. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to through this. What 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 ha what does the uh the, the observer see? Like, sorry, what is the, uh, the trap, like the person on the pole see? Like, what is the sequence? What is the sequence like? So first you would see It's going to extend this out a little bit further. First you would see this going through, then he would see This going through, then you can see like the like, wouldn't the other end be sticking out of the part still? No, the whole part both ends are in the part. Yeah. Wait, where? Okay. Oh yeah. So this is this is the end of the pole. So at no point, according to me, are both ends of the pole in the barn at the same time. Is this correct? I think I think the, um, the the reason the resolution to this paradox is that uh, the concept of something like fitting within the barn involves the concept of simultaneity, and since the two observers don't agree about things being simultaneous, um, like the question doesn't doesn't necessarily even make sense. So the question of like does the pole fit in the barn or not? Yeah. So it's not actually about the length of the pole changing, but it's still about time. That, that's a good question. So it does really seem like length contraction and time dilation are two sides of the same coin. And in a sense, they are. But again, time dilation works in any, like, it doesn't matter where Shashir is in reference to me. We both will experience time differently. But length contraction is slightly different because that only works in the, act, in the same, like, parallel to the direction that I'm moving. So they're not exactly two sides of the same coin. They are two different effects. I think one thing um, to, to make sure you understand is that it's none of it is an illusion. It's not yeah. like you think the length is shorter, but it's really this time. No, it's actually shorter. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do but um, wait, I, go ahead, go ahead. Speak. Yeah. So, um, what what do you mean by it's actually shorter? Like, like um, if you were to measure it, or, right, like if that person tried to measure that length, it would actually be shorter. As would the time, the time would actually be different. Mm -hmm. This is not an illusion. This is actually happening. So I also have a question from the previous part. So why did um, Shashank, like why did you get older when you got back from um, the star or whatever? Because, oh, well, well, when I get back, I would be younger. Shashir would be older if he stayed. Because my time would be moving more slowly than Shashir's time aggregate throughout the journey. So you were talking about the energy during the acceleration and deceleration, is that a reason or? Okay, so this is the way the story goes, right? So basically, the, the, the paradox is that, uh, well, like, it seems like the problem is very symmetric, right? Because, you, you know, he goes on a spaceship, he goes to the other planet, he comes back, right? But then you could sort of think of the Earth as a spaceship, right? And then, the, and then like, you know, from his perspective, he's stationary because the spaceship is sort of going over there and coming back. And the question is, you know, who's actually right, okay? Um, like, you know, because like, we think that somebody should end up older, right? And the solution to this paradox, as you said, is that actually the, like, he's not allowed to pretend he's in an inertial reference frame because he has to turn around. No matter how fast um, he does that, he, he has to turn around. Okay. One thing that's important to note, though, which is pretty mind-blowing, is that if, like, before he turns around, the symmetry of this problem is not broken, actually, which means that he believes that he's younger, he believes that he's younger, and they're actually both right, even though they disagree on who's older. Yeah, yeah. So like when, yeah. when he's heading towards Alpha Centauri, from his perspective, the Earth, like for all intents and purposes, he hasn't accelerated yet. The Earth is moving away from him at, at like close to the speed of light or whatever, right? 
And from, from my perspective on Earth, Shashank is on his rocket ship moving on his rocket ship, right? So both of us think that um, the other one is younger. Um, and both of us are right. And the kicker is, suppose you were Shashank in the spaceship, and you turn around, what do you see? Well, before you turn around, like, Shashir looks younger for the entire leg of the journey. And then right as he turns around, he basically ages like 80 years instantly. <laughs> and then he comes back <laughs> and then he's older. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is, uh, this is really mind-blowing, and, and we can like debate in, in length. And we have actually debated in length about like, the, like, the, the causality of, of all of this. But if, if it helps to think about this, in reality, things will accelerate. If I have to get on a rocket and travel, then that means I have to accelerate, which means this doesn't quite apply in that, in that same sense. So if that, if that helps it sit better, then... I, 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 I mean, still, still a couple questions. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just talking about, like, so if you return to your inertial reference frame, would, your, would that state of ambiguity, ambiguity like just completely cease to exist, or would you still... Would if you still return to your inertial yeah, reference like, frame? Yeah, if you return to, like, let's say, like, the... Um, the two initial assumptions of having like initial reference frame and, and the speed of light C, like uh -huh. so like let's say like after you're done accelerating like you you, you return to your initial reference frame yeah would that state of ambiguity ambiguity just cease to exist right so if there are two people and they're both in the same inertial reference frame then from each of their perspectives because they're moving at the same velocity relative to each other they think that the other person's stationary so yes they would agree on everything right so it would just be resolved in there Right, yeah, right. in the same inertial reference frame. But yeah, if you're in yeah. two different inertial reference frames, that like, yeah. ambiguity exists in real life. Okay. Yeah. okay, I know you probably have more questions, but there, there is more mind-blowing stuff that I would like to, to go through. So save it, write the questions down and like, save them for office hours or discussions. Or, or um, at the end of lecture. Yeah, so okay. next, next topic. So, when? Pythagorean theorem. Okay, x squared plus y squared plus c squared l squared is equal to this. Okay? If I have this stick, it has a certain length, right? Why do we have the squares here? Why don't we just add x squared plus y squared plus z squared? Like, let's say we were in Manhattan, right? You, you know in Manhattan, like, all the streets are, like, parallel to each other and then, like, perpendicular? Right? So if you have to go somewhere in Manhattan, the, the best way to describe length is just like I move this long, this, this many steps north and this many steps east. That's sort of just like adding x plus y. In Manhattan, you can measure lengths by just adding the length you traveled in one direction and the length you traveled in the other direction. Why is it that in general physicists and mathematicians and everyone else describes length with the square term. Why, why is that? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah? Because they're two different lengths. Like, but which one's correct? Is getting to the same point. Which one's correct? Which one do we use in physics? In yeah, which, well, well, yeah, which one is correct? We know, we know this one's supposed to be correct according to the Pythagorean theorem, but like, like, why don't we use Manhattan distances where you just like, like in, in Manhattan, it actually makes sense. If you have to get to a building, and it, it doesn't matter what route you take. Um, you're long, but you physically can't move along that. that yeah, you can't move as the crow flies, so you just move in one direction. Um, and it doesn't matter what route you take, you will end up with the same length that you travel in the end, no matter what route you take. Um, why does that not work in general? Yeah? Because you can't apply that to when you're walking like not in x or y or z, but the other one, if you just set like y or z to zero, you can still apply it when you're walking on that. Kind of. I mean, it, you can break any like motion into x's and y's and z's. Um, you can. It, it's slightly deeper than that. Like, let's, let, let me actually like draw out an axis. Okay? And I have this which is, let's say that's a meter. So this is my y and this is my x. And I have this meter stick here. And this is the length, right? 
as long as this length is only in the x-axis, it's just whatever, whatever distance in the x-axis is, right? But what happens when I rotate it? When I rotate it, this is where its things are. So now there's a different length in x and a different length in y. And there's, there's a, there's a non-zero length in y as well. So now, like, when I do the rotation, it's like the x and y is sort of like mix into each other. Yeah? Um, is it because you're restricted to moving in certain yeah. directions or dimensions? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the essence of it. The other thing is, in Manhattan, you never have to deal with rotations. You just move north or east, or west or south. You never actually have to deal with, with rotations of space in Manhattan. So the, the, the reason why this square term is necessary is because we want the, the only way to get the x's and y's to mix and still give us the same length, because this length doesn't change when I rotate it. The only way for that to happen, to, for these to mix and still give the same length, is if I have these square terms. Now, I just, I just said that now lengths are sort of like meaningless. Like this length can change if I start moving really fast. Right? So, so now length is no longer what's called an invariant. And when I say invariant, I mean it no longer stays the same. Every, every, like, I, we can no longer agree on length being exactly the same no matter what. Um, technically, length is invariant under Galilean relativity under rotation. Right? In this case, length is no longer invariant under special relativistic transformations called Lorentz transformations. But Length doesn't work anymore, basically. Now, how do we fix this? Well, like let's say I have to meet you here at a cafe tomorrow. Like, we can just communicate telepathically so we don't actually need to do this, but like, let's say we couldn't. I'm kidding about that. Um, we would have to agree on a place, which is the, the x, y, and z coordinates of the cafe. But we'd also have to agree on a time to meet, right? And so the, the key here is to fix the issue of lengths not being the same by adding a time term to our Pythagorean theorem. And so I'm going to change this L to an S so it's not confusing. And I'm going to add this term. CT squared minus CT squared. And it turns out, in special relativity, and this is no longer length, it's called... By the way, the only reason we're using S in place of length is because physicists do that. So don't get confused. S means length. In yeah, S, S. So, so, and also, technically, you have deltas here. This is called... So well, deltas called are a method. change. Well, what is it called again, Nicholas? I am blanking. Invariant length? Yes, it's an invariant interval. Invariant interval, okay. Or, yeah, invariant. Okay. Um, so this is like... Does anybody have any questions about this? Is this weird? It should be weird. It was very weird for me when I saw this. Um, yeah? Like, what, what's up the... Yes, yes. So why do you subtract it? I actually don't know the answer to this question perfectly either. All I know is, is that, according to one of my math major friends, if this was a plus, time would literally be the, the fourth spatial dimension. The only reason why we don't live in a four, four spatial dimensional universe with no real concept of time and think of time as something different from our three spatial dimensions is because this is a minus sign. 
So you have that one minus sign to thank for the universe as you know it. Um, but, so, so this length means that you have a length and you have a time and they mix into each other to make sure that this is always conserved. Wait, Nicole, you had a question? Uh, I just had a question about interstellar. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this is a very good question. I'll, I'll think about it more and, and try, try, to, try to give you more of an intuition for why it's minus. But the other thing I can say about this is this, this means that, that lengths are invariant under hyperbolic rotation. Um, have, have you, if, you, if, you, if any of you have taken a trig class, you might know that like x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared plus is equal to one. That's an that's a, that's an ellipsoid, right? And if I change this to a minus sign, now that's a hyperboloid, right? Alternatively, like this can be described using cosines and sines, like. This, if you've ever seen on your calculator the, the cosh and the cinch, like you can describe this using those. So basically, normal lengths in Galilean relativity are, are invariant to regular rotations. These are invariant to hyperbolic rotations. I think there's something cool about this, like um, sine theta and like cos theta. Theta is like a rotation, and that works for like x squared plus y squared. So we've covered how rotation and lengths are related to each other. If you've heard of like the hyperbolic trig functions, why are they called the hyperbolic trig functions? Because when you add a minus sign, when it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus ct squared, that becomes a hyperbola. And now you use cosh and cinch. Um, if, you, if you've heard of those terms, this, this might be pretty cool to you. So this is this is this is called invariant length. I think this is really interesting. Um, but so the next thing, and this is this is very related to the first. So now now we can kind of see why people say things like time is the fourth dimension, because in a sense it really is the fourth dimension. But again, it's not a fourth spatial dimension. Um, it's not a fourth spatial dimension because of this minus sign. It's different from position, but it is, in a sense, a fourth dimension. So, yeah. So if it was plus, then technically we could go to any point in time if we experience it. Yeah. Space. I have to think about that, but I want to say I, yes. Yeah. I want to say it would act like a spatial dimension. There's a very mind-blowing problem on the next problem set, not this week's that deals with this relating to black holes. Yeah. I think that's a yeah. really, really cool problem, and you'll see how this sort of affects calculations that you do when you're near black holes. So I was thinking about four vectors, and then I realized that maybe not all of you know what a vector is. So I'm, I'm just going to recap that um, really quickly. Or if you, this is the first time you've heard of it, like position is a vector. Force is a vector. Momentum is a vector. And all of these normally under like, let's ignore special relativity exists for a second. All of these normally can be described by three numbers. So a vector is just like an arrow pointing in space. Like, for instance, you have your arrow in two dimensional space, or that's an X. And there's a y, right? You can have an arrow pointing in three-dimensional space. A vector is just an arrow pointing in space. So position, you can have an arrow of position pointing somewhere in space. And it can be described by an x term, a y term, and a z term, right? So you have x, y, and z, position. For force, you have force in the x direction, force in the y direction, and force in the z direction. For momentum, we represent momentum as a P. So you have momentum in the x direction, momentum in the y direction, and momentum in the z direction. Normally, you 
like these all, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to mix these and get an invariant, right? Momentum, the momentum vector, the force vector, the position vector, right? And in order to get the true, like for the true position vector, you just use the Pythagorean theorem. Why? So now, now we've established that, that, that there's a problem with this. And so we fixed that problem by introducing this CT squared term. So now what we can do is for everything, for, for, for a lot of things at any rate, we just add like a time term, CT. And so now what was originally a three, like something with three terms, now becomes, sorry, position, position is ct squared, or ct x, y, z. Now that's the four vector for position. It's four numbers with which you can represent position in space-time. Um, Does this sort of make sense? So any event has a location and a time, right? And the position can be described by the... Is it actually a time or is it like the system of time? It is... Do I have... Well, I can't, I can't introduce proper time. But this is, this is um, like... Like, we don't agree with, like, with positions either, right? But we can still, in, in our reference frame, we have a certain time, we have a certain position, right? So that's in our reference frame, right? And it doesn't matter what reference frame you're in, if you sum these in this way, you will agree on it equaling delta S squared, right? So whether it's Cher looking up at me on the rocket, or whether it's me moving in the rocket, we'll agree on the delta S squared even if we don't agree on these specific terms. Okay, that's, that's the crucial thing. Now, this is, this is, the mind, this is a slightly interesting um, um, generalization. There are other four vectors that exist. Um, and to think of one potential four vector, let's try to think of the equivalent for momentum. And for this, I want you to think back to our lecture on um, our first lecture. Um, if you remember momentum, you remember Noether's theorem, right? What is what is momentum like? Like momentum conservation. What is that related to? It's related to a certain symmetry. Remember, according to Noether's theorem, does anyone remember what that symmetry was? It's a continuous symmetry, yes. But yeah, yeah. So so what translation? Like like yeah, you're right. You're right. Trans like position translation, right? So, so, but it's called translational symmetry. So, momentum um, is sort of analogous to position translational symmetry. So, I'm going to write down the four vector for momentum is going to look like something with an, a momentum in x, momentum in y, momentum in z, because momentum is the result of, of position translational symmetry. Well, in Noether's theorem, we need something that looks like a time. In Noether's theorem, we have something that's the result of time translational symmetry. What is that? Does anyone remember? Conservation of energy. Conservation of energy. And indeed, ignore the C, okay? The C, the, the constants come out of the math. But indeed, you have an energy term here. Um, and so this is the momentum four vector. Momentum. Um, this is the four vector for momentum. And this is interesting because is equal to something so, so again, with any four vectors, you sum them like, like you sum the position vector, 
and you should get something invariant, something constant. It just so happens that this constant thing is equal to this. What does this mean? Well, let's say you're at rest and you're not moving. Your momentum terms are zero. And so that means you're left with This is a lot of math. You, you don't have to understand the math, you can like, but you can sort of tune out here. But right? So this cancels, this cancels, and the negative sign cancel. And so what you're left with is E squared is equal to M squared C or C squared. C squared. No, that's not right. It is it is it is I don't think the C term is here. Wait, what? Maybe, maybe the C term is not here. I think. I'm not even I'll check. But you should get C to the fourth here. And, well, this is, this is how Einstein basically squared. Like, squared. There needs to be a C squared on the first three terms. <laughs> okay. Ignoring the constants, because I think constants are kind of annoying, anyways. Um, Maybe that's just sour grapes. But this is how Einstein got E equals MC squared, um, roughly. And I don't think this is how Einstein got it, but this is one way to form this is, this is This is one way to take what we've learned in special relativity and arrive at this E equals MC squared, which everyone has heard of and is very cool. So, so that's interesting. There are other four vectors, though. Like, for instance, um, uh, there's, there's like the current four vector, which is like, like um, current. So you guys did um, did E and M last week. Um, in some sense, there's a current in X, a current in Y, and a current in Z, which is a moving charge, a charge that's moving. And for the time term, well, this, this is something that's kind of dicey even for me, but um, a, a charge that's not moving in position is moving in time. So, so if you have a charge times C, that's, that's, that's in the time term. So this is the four vector for current. And there are analogous four vectors to a lot of quantities. This is not the only one. How much time do we have? Five minutes left. Okay, so in the last five minutes, questions? If anyone has questions, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what about the four vectors for force? Huh? Oh, that's, that's energy changing in time, uh, is, is the corresponding uh, T term. But the force one isn't as interesting, I would say. Yeah. So in the last five minutes, I'm going to write this equation down again. Oops. Uh, you broke the universe. <laughs> I broke the universe. Okay. <laughs> um, so now, now if I take a look at this equation again, and, and again, this equation relates events, right? If there's an event, it has a certain x, y, z, and t associated with it. And if I have another event, it has another x, y, z, and t associated with it, right? And now, now I want to introduce the idea of like separation. And again, this is a separation, right? So there's the idea of a time-like separation. And, and this can be a lot of things. So let's say, let's take um, the example of two events where um, they're separated by a lot of time, but not by a lot of position. They're close to each other, but they're separated apart by a lot of time. This would dominate the term, and hence you would get something negative for the for the separation, right? So delta squared. Delta squared. Yeah. Delta squared. Um, and now you have your 
You also have your light-like separations, where this and this are the same. This is like, why is it called light-like? It's because like light is the is the is the only thing that can like that can do this. But uh, if 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 your separation and position is equal to your separation in time, then this is equal to zero, and it's called a light-like separation. And finally, you have your space-like. Where, where the, the, the separation in position is greater than the separation in time. And this is positive. Now, in your pole barn analogy, in, in, if you recall like the pole barn example I gave, um, this end of the barn and this end of the barn, what separation do they have? in this example. Can anyone like two choices? Yeah. They're space like separated because they're space far enough that we don't agree on on like like we don't agree on 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 the like like whether this is simultaneity is, is broken in, in space like separation. Um, but what this also means is that, that um, in a space-like separation, if you have a space-like separation, um, there is some reference frame in which an observer will think the two events are simultaneous. There is some reference frame. So in this whole barn analogy, if she's just sitting down, like, down here and watching, this is what he sees. Right? I have lights. Um, so basically, when there's a space like separation of two events, which are this going through and this going through, um, that means in some reference frame, both the events are simultaneous, occur at the same time. And correspondingly, with a time like separation, if you have a time like separation, there is a reference frame in which both of the events occur in the same position. But I have to think about that more myself. So don't ask any questions this lecture. But I, 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 think, I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions from the last 30 seconds? Or from general? Uh, I thought that the way of parentheses are that that couldn't result in a negative value because in the square. That, that, is, that is true. So physicists will use this like to like sort of an analogy with length though, right? Delta S squared, but it's allowed to be negative. You're not allowed to take the square root of that, like in a normal way. It's, it's you are, and, I mean, and you and get and imaginary and numbers, but yeah, and, and also like, oops, sorry. and also you have to keep in mind that like like this term, the ct squared term, is like is different from our ordinary notion of length. So normal lengths can't be negative, but this this separation can actually be. And it's, because, it's all because of this annoying negative sign. But also you have your, your, your familiar notion of time to think about negatives.